This story is about the 24 Ukrainian sailors who were captured by Russia near the Kerch Strait in November 2018. This episode of the hybrid of war and the consequent events serve well to illustrate the current and future drawbacks which Ukraine is encountering right now and which will remain even after the end of the war. Russia violated the immunity of military boats, captured Ukrainian sailors, and refuses to recognize them as prisoners of war. The International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea obliged Russia and Federation to return the Ukrainians and boats, but the decision remains unfulfilled. They are prosecuted under the Russian law as if they were an organized crime group. Does the international community and justice have any leverage on Russia, or is Ukraine left opposing the aggressor country alone? How does Ukraine defend its marine territories without jeopardizing Ukrainian military, and how does it return those already captured? The footage depicts the beginning of the capture of Ukrainian military boats on November 25, 2018. They were moving from the Odessa port to the Mariupol port. Russian military fired shots near the Kerch Strait and captured 24 members of the crew, 22 seamen and two security service officers. This transfer was second. The first one took place in September 2018. Back then, everything went according to plan. The second one ended tragically. Sailors and boats are captured by the Russian military. Russia pronounces them an organized crime group and illegal infiltrators. The Ukrainian president implements martial law in 10 regions. The incident is politicized, the spin being, in full knowledge of the likely repercussions, why were the sailors ordered to head to the strait anyway? We went to defend our strait and our sea. Everybody could see the escalation of the conflict. It was being conducted by the Russian Federation in the Sea of Azov, and from April 2018 it was only getting worse. This is what is meant. In March 2018, Ukrainian border guard arrests the Ukrainian fishing boat Nord, which went under the Russian flag. In response, Russians arrest two Ukrainian fishing boats, accusing the fishermen of poaching. This marks the beginning of the so-called blockade. Russian border guards increase the frequency of the checks for ships bound for Ukrainian ports, whilst Russia increases the presence of naval forces in the Azov area. Because of this, the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine decides to increase the presence of naval forces in the region. Through the construction of a bridge across the Kerch Strait, a sort of valve was created and Russia started openly blackmailing with this facility, letting us in, then letting us out. For some reason, passage to Russian ports wasn't hindered. Ships headed for our ports were subjected to checks and searches. Three vessels took part in the transfer, gunboats, Nikopol, and Berdyansk. And the tugboat Yani Kupu. The transfer began on November 23rd. The sailors' relatives remember this day as the last time they spoke before the capture. I couldn't get hold of him, so I called mom and asked, what's with Vova? She says he still hasn't called. It was already evening when I read about their capture in the news. Naturally, no one got any sleep that night. The news, then this whole nightmare. Our life has been a sort of thriller TV show for the past six months. Hey, mom, it's your son writing. As far as possible, everything is fine with me. We have food, we are dressed and shoot. I even go for walks. I never thought that I could so enjoy occasional walks. Many thanks to Dasha for the letter. I was very pleased to receive it. Also, send my thanks to Denise Antonov and say hi to all of our relatives and to our school. Send hugs to everyone at school and see you soon. This is Natalia mother of captive Roman Mokriak, captain of Berdyansk. There are three sons in the Mokriak family. Their mother is a teacher and the father is in the military. However, only Roman chose to serve at the sea. Before Odessa, he, like most of the captured sailors, served in Sevastopol. 
on a submarine until the peninsula was annexed. The memory of the event still sends shivers down Natalia's spine. When the events in Crimea began, it was the end of February. The green man came and the commander phoned. Report to the boat immediately. He went and I was on the phone the whole time. Son, what's going on there? Mom, everything is fine. There's all this stuff on TV about a referendum. What's going on out there? It's all fine, don't watch TV, it's all lies. I wanted to believe everything your man said. I thought the worst had already happened in 2014. I couldn't imagine there would be a war, that they would be captured. After the annexation of Crimea, Mokryak moved to serve in Odessa, where he captained the Berdyansk. He was always so happy to be in the Navy, so proud. In Sevastopol, he would always show me around and say, let's go look at my swallow. He would show everything with such pride, tell me all about it. I saw that everything was so old, the boat too. I was so worried about him. The day after the boat group left the port of Odessa, the Russian ship Suzdalets started accompanying them. And within a few minutes, a Russian Mi-8 helicopter flies by. When the small anti-submarine warfare ship Suzdalets first appeared and the helicopter belonging to the Black Sea Fleet flew by, they just established contact. Before this, the passage was clear along the 12-mile zone and the boat group was virtually unseeable. And when we said that we would pass, they were surprised that the boats appeared there. The Russian Coast Guard boat informs the Ukrainian side about the rules of passing the Kerch Strait. But 23 minutes later, the Russian side announces that the passage is closed from 10 p.m. on November 24th until 10 p.m. on November 26th. The coordinator of the Marine Geographical Region, Naveria 3, Navtech Station, and Ukrainian Dershika Drofia, approached by Naval Command after the capture, confirmed that as of November 24th, navigation through the Kerch Strait was not restricted. November 25th, 2018, 3.58 a.m., the commander of the Bevdyansk Roman Mokryak informs the border post of the Russian FSB and the port control services of Kerch and the Caucasus of their intention to cross the Kerch Strait. a.m. Ukrainian boats cross the 12-mile zone. 6.26 a.m. The Russian military commenced dangerous maneuvers barring passage, then set an ultimatum demanding the ships exit the 12-mile zone. 6.34 a.m. Russia moves in to ram the ships and threatens them with arms. An Mi-8 military helicopter flies overhead. <laughs> Around 8 o'clock in the morning, an attempt to ram the Berdyansk. The Ukrainian boat maneuvers and Russian boats Don and Izamurud collide together. The latter sustains damage to its starboard section. a.m. After that, Port Control provides the Ukrainian boats with anchoring space to await passage through the channel. They stood there throughout the daylight hours. And all this time, while they were standing there, the boat was probably easier to stop and easier to capture than when it moves at full speed, especially at night. All this time, the Russian border guards did not actually make any attempts to seize them. And the Russian side cannot clearly explain what was the status of these people. Neither now, nor it will be able to later, because it just cannot be explained with reason. They cannot explain what happened what the status of these Ukrainian people and boats is, in the interval when they tried not to let them into this water area in the morning, and the time when they tried not to let them out of it in the evening. Who were they at this time? Were they trespassers? Or were they awaiting permission to pass? 11.55 a.m. The Russian boat Don is ready to lock the anchor chains of the Ukrainian boats, i.e. entangle them with the anchor and the chain of another ship to halt the movement. 12. Novorossiysk station issues a coastal warning via Navtex about the prohibition of passage. So, this happens a day late and with Ukraine already present in shared waters. Oh, 
1.42 p.m., the dispatch service Kerch Traffic informs that passage through the strait is closed in both directions, supposedly due to a tanking running aground near the Kerch Bridge Arch. Russia jams maritime radio and navigation. 5.36 p.m., Ukrainians decide to return to Odessa. 5.59 p.m., Russian FSB Coast Guard ships Dawn demands Ukrainian ships halt the engine. p.m., the Ukrainian craft are surrounded by 11 Russian ships which proceed to block the exit from the Kerch Strait. The Ukrainian vessels are subsequently fired upon, leaving the Berdyansk and Yanikapu dead in the water, while Nikopol is blocked outside the 12-mile zone. 8 p.m. Russian special forces board the Ukrainian ships and capture the crew. You know, I think this has been a lesson to everybody, to each in their way. In terms of psychology, everything happens for a reason, as a chance to learn, to change. We will appreciate each other more, trust more, respect more. What we may have lacked before will now be replenished. This is Tatiana, wife of captured Sergei Popov. She recounts how she found out about the tragedy. I found out only on the 25th. His mother called me around 5 p.m. and said the ramming of the tugboat was in the Donetsk People's Republic's news. They are from the Donetsk region and she still has friends there. After her call, I began ringing up his fellow servicemen, monitoring the internet, scanning the news. Tatiana and Sergei have been together for four years and have two children. Sergei grew up one of many siblings, and upon finishing school, he graduated from the Nakhimov Academy in Sevastopol, where he continued to serve until Russia's occupation of Crimea. He says he chose the military so as not to burden his parents financially. He decided to cast in his lot with the army because you are provided for by the state and ultimately chose the sea. His mother hardly expected this. When he told her that he was joining the Navy, she was dumbstruck. How? Why the Navy? You've been to the sea twice in your life. And I can't say he especially loves the sea either. He is a man of his word. He knows what he wants and, for the most part, knows how to get it. This firmness, which can be an issue in personal relationships, also helps him very much in life. This determination of his is what charmed me the most. How were the border guards supposed to act? Military ships enter Russian territory waters and fail to respond. Their intentions were unclear. What were they to do? We have a well-recorded fact of Russian aggression towards Ukraine in the Sea of Azov. There are excerpts from speeches given by the presidents of Russia and Ukraine in the wake of the Ukrainian sailors' capture. Russia alleges that the Ukrainian ships had violated its territorial waters. On November 26, the Ukrainian parliament imposes martial law in 10 regions. The morning of November 26 brings news of three wounded sailors. They are at hospital number one in Kerch. Of course, we sought to know what kind of injuries were sustained by our sailors, as well as the total number of wounded men. We confirmed that there were three, Eider, Artemenko, Soroka. They all received various degrees of injuries. Some were severe. Had their fellow crew members not administered first aid when they did, they may not have been alive today. In the evening of the same day, the FSB releases a video depicting Ukrainian sailors Volodymyr Lisovi and Andrei Sibuzov an SBU officer, Andrei Drach, reading an off-screen text, supposedly confessing to the illegal border crossing. 
I was worried that the actions of the Ukrainian Navy ships in the Kerch Strait were of a provocative nature. In line with my orders, I plan to effect the transfer of the ships from Odessa to Mariupol. The following day, each of the captives was handed a letter from Ihor Voronchenko, naval commander-in-chief. The entire Navy treat the so-called testimony you're being forced to give with understanding. After all, the methods of the Russian special services are no secret to anyone. You acted within the law, professionally, per the norms of international maritime law, and your contract. The law is on our side, and the whole world understands this. I am proud of every one of you, and I thank you for your loyalty to your fatherland. The lawyers, in turn, stressed that these confessions were obtained in a non-procedural way. It seems their mindset at the time was, first off, let's make sure we have them on video. The decision to work with this case by the book, to create a show trial, to transfer it from Crimea to Moscow, was made later on. This move makes brute force uncalled for, requiring a more sophisticated approach. And I suspect that once the case is revealed to us, if it does make it past the investigation and into court, we will hardly encounter these videos. Ahoy bandits! Today is April 1. Hooray! So I decided to write something again. Things are all the same with me. Nothing new, nothing interesting going on. Trapped behind bars in dampness I dwell. A young hearted eagle brought up in a cell, as Pushkin wrote. Otherwise, I'm fine. I eat well, I'm warmly dressed, healthy, fresh, in a positive mood and full of optimism. I finally received your letters the other day, the ones you wrote for Businka's birthday. I got both the scans and the originals, with the postcards and pics as well. The pics are awesome. Businka looks so grown up already. It's so sad that I can't see her grow. Love you and miss you. See you soon. This is Tatiana, sister of captured sailor Andrei Shevchenko. She recalls how she first heard about the tragedy and how she prepared for the court hearing. When I called the hotline and they confirmed that he was really on those seized ships, I was given the phone number of Olha Rishitilova, the volunteer who helped us get through to a lawyer. And then through a lawyer, Andri wrote us a small note. The lawyer was able to take a picture of it with his phone and send it to us. So we at least knew that he was fine, that he was alive and well. Then on the 26th, or the 27th, someone from the Navy called Andrei's wife, Nastya, began to find other relatives. Then they gathered us in a group, and then there was a meeting with the Navy. He was permitted one phone call. He called his wife on Viber and told her not to worry, that everything was fine and he was alive and well. Court hearings take place in Annex Crimea on November 27th till the 28th, 2018. Ukrainian seamen are being charged under Article 322 of the Criminal Code of the Russian Federation. Illegal border crossing. Three wounded sailors were tied in Kerch Hospital without access to lawyers. Only some of the sailors had defenders by agreement, those whose relatives managed to contact Ukrainian volunteers and human rights activists. Others are provided with defenders from the state. Most sailors refuse to testify to the FSB. My client currently refuses to testify. And Roman Mokriak, captain of the Berdyansk, asks to free everyone except him. One decision is announced for all two months arrest. On November 30th, the seamen are transported to Moscow. 21 of them are taken to the Lefortovo pre-trial detention center, the three wounded to the medical unit of the Sailor Silence prison. We still don't have any medical certificates that would confirm or disconfirm their condition at the time of their injury, what manipulations they were subjected to, and what needs to be done now to ensure the complete recovery of our prisoners of war. He 
He says that his grandfather was captured by pirates, and for the first two months he would wake up at night and shout, Grandpa, can't get out because the bars are very strong, and cry, saying, we will go help him. But now he climbs onto the gate, takes a Ukrainian flag and shouts, Grandpa, we are here, can you see me? Maybe you are on your way, but you got lost. And we tell him that granddad saw him, he's already on his way. And we can't explain what's taking the grandpa so long to a four-year-old child. It's very tough. This is Irina, the wife of Yanni Kapu, midshipman Yuri Budzulu. He served in Crimea, left the peninsula after the annexation and served in the Donbass. When I spoke of his age and said he needs to retire, he was horrified. I'm not an old man yet. I can keep working. There are ships there. There is a war. I will serve until the incomprehensible war between our countries ends. That's how he put it. It was Yuri who got the Yanni Kapu up and running and worked it for a significant time. Irina tells us that above all, her husband loves ships and the sea. The sea meant everything to him. Whenever I told him to do something around the house, he would say, my house is my ship. In his letters, Yuri assures that everything is fine. He apologizes for being on a vacation in Russia, thanks his love to everyone, says he is fine and wished us a happy new year. He wrote before new year, but I only received the letter in spring. I haven't received anything things, they won't let him. Maybe the idea is that he's the oldest of the group, knows much, and he's from Crimea after all. They have the FSB, who have all the data. I gather that they are being told they don't have any letters, it's a form of psychological pressure. In Moscow, the captured sailors are tended to by local volunteers. They organize regular deliveries of food and other items. The list is confirmed with the lawyers, who gather the requests directly from the prisoners. The shopping takes up a whole day, then almost a whole day for packaging. All this is rather hard work. Then you have to write up an inventory in three copies, then double-check everything, then you transport it all, then stand your ground before the others who have come to other people on trial. 21 sudden newcomers is a nightmare for them as well. So you stand before this tiny window and shudder, will they accept it or not? Slowly you turn into this small bug because you understand that everything is against you and no one really gives a damn about some bug. Over the New Year holidays, the sailors are visited in their cells by unidentified men without insignia, who attempt to beat a testimony out of them. Regrettably, they were subjected to pressure. This happened over the New Year holidays, as well as before and after the holidays. Court hearings took place at the Lefortable District Court in January, April and July 2019. The sailors refused to respond to any of the judges' questions, excluding those about their age, name and rank. We maintain that the captured sailors are prisoners of war, that they are under the protection of the Third Geneva Convention, that the Russian authorities consistently violate the norms of international humanitarian law by treating them as criminals and not as prisoners of war. Our questions to the prosecutor concerning the grounds for this investigation remained unanswered. The official FSB site speaks of a supposed plan to illegally transport the Ukrainian ships, the crew of which are referred to as an armed gang. The investigators requested that the hearing be adjourned on the pretense that the information contained in the defense's petition may obstruct the investigation. The request was granted. The relatives had mere minutes to converse with the sailors. <laughs> Thank you.
Дуже дякую. The first row was taken up by the men in masks, as they are tolerantly referred to, to stop us from talking. I began to communicate via gestures, whisper something from the back. I received a rapid man, then another, and I couldn't take it anymore, so I got up, walked around them, came up to the cage and started asking, how's your health? What did they send you? I got the feeling he couldn't hear me, he just smiled, probably because he saw me, saw that I had made it. He just sat there and smiled. I asked, why are you laughing? You're in big trouble. When you get back, everyone's being worried sick. In January, April and July, the court rules to extend the sailors' arrest for three more months. The reason why the Lofotova District Court comes up so often in news from Russia is that its territorial jurisdiction covers the FSB, Criminal Investigation Department, and they deal with all matters relating to the department's activities, sanction searches, phone tapping, and also extend arrests. Never has it been that for a serious case, and this case has been assigned government priority. And even Putin has remarked that it should be handled by the investigation. So no fault of a court judge would dare change the preventive measure. Hi Lelik, I received your letter like a New Year's present. At first, they brought me a notification saying it had been declined by censorship, but then I guess they decided to give it to me after all. Words couldn't express my joy. I saw my parents at the hearing. They held up well, but Dad seemed to be very distressed. Have a talk with him. He seems very sick at heart. As usual, he understands everything but keeps it all to himself. Talk to them more. It's what they need very much right now. I expect my letters will take long to arrive, yet they need your support today. This is Ola, the sister of Denis Hritsenko, who commanded the mission on November 23rd. Denis graduated from the Nakimov Academy in 2006. He served in Crimea and after the spring of 2014 in Odessa, he has a wife and a son waiting at home. It was just me, Nadia and the boy. We're emotional women and we simply couldn't leave him. So we always took him with us. He would attend every meeting. Wherever we went, he would come too. Of course he got to hear it all. The president gave him an award. It was all over the news. He was the most popular kid in school. But he didn't actually understand what had happened. On her part, Ola is busy communicating with international organizations and governments whom the sailor's relatives provide with updates and appeal to for help. They communicate our story on all levels, at the United Nations, the OSCE and the Council of Europe. In January, the Ministry of Justice filed an interstate application to the European Court of Human Rights. Additionally, our colleagues, lawyers from Ukraine, have appealed to two UN committees. The United Nations Human Rights Committee and the Committee Against Torture have contacted the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention and are currently preparing individual complaints to the ECHR. The sailors' lawyers note that the story of an attack on Ukrainian ships near the Kerch Strait was an international matter from the very outset, as they were captured in the international waters of the Black Sea. This is backed up by the military ship's coordinates at the time they came under fire and were seized. According to Article 95 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, military ships enjoy immunity on the high seas, while UN General Assembly Resolution 3314, adopted December 14, 1974, stipulates that an attack by the armed forces of a state on the sea forces or marines fleet of another state qualifies as an act of aggression. These were arguments presented by Ukraine at a session of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in Hamburg. At the time, Russia refused to take part in the hearing, claiming that the tribunal does not have the jurisdiction to mediate the Kerch conflict. Russia has violated the basic principle of the immunity of the worship under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Ukraine has instituted an arbitration under Article Annex 7 of the Convention and seek relief for this violation. On May 25th, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea ordered Russia to return the Ukrainian sailors and ships and report on the decision's implementation within a month. Russia failed to comply with the decision. By 19 votes to 1, the Russian Federation shall immediately release the Ukrainian naval vessels Berdyansk, Nikopol, and Yanikapu and return them 
to the custody of Ukraine. Russia attempted to ignore the tribunal's ruling in the past in the 2013 case of the Arctic Sunrise. A Dutch ship carrying Greenpeace activists. The ship was detained along with all crew and passengers by Russian coast guards after an attempted protest action near a drilling rig in the Pechora Sea. The International Tribunal ordered for them to be released, but Russia refused. After some time, however, it released the captured activist and paid the Dutch government compensation of several million euros. A Ministry of Foreign Affairs official explains what awaits Russia in the event it refuses to comply with the tribunal's ruling. Russia realizes that until the international tribunal's decision is implemented, its legal right to be at sea is compromised. The immediate question is whether other nations will choose to respect the immunity of Russia's warships. And I'm not talking about Ukraine necessarily, but any other country. It is evident that they cannot set themselves above the law in every maritime-related issue. The sailors' lawyers do not rule out that their defendants may be released after the upcoming parlamentary elections. A certain Ukrainian politician spoke with Vladimir Putin recently. I'm referring to Viktor Medvedchuk, and the topic of their discussion was the imprisoned sailors. This indicates that the issue has taken center stage for Russian authorities and will, I expect, be used to gain leverage over public opinion in Ukraine when it comes to the above-mentioned politician and his political power. The Russian president himself does not rule out this turn of events either. I was recently informed of four releases in the DPR and LPR brokered by Mr. Medvedchuk. This is a good example of work, of direct contact with the relevant party, and there you have a result. If the current government continues to work in this direction, we will definitely achieve much. Ukraine's incumbent president Volodymyr Zelensky notes that the sailors' release is now an issue of high priority. And I am personally doing all I can to transform all the talks for their release into firm hugs for our boys when they finally are released. June 25th was the deadline set for the Russian Federation to report on the release of the Ukrainian sailors. The day brings news that the Ukrainian ships have vanished from the Kerch dock. On July 15th, Russian ombudsperson Tatyana Moskalkova arrives in Kiev to attend a court hearing in the case of RIA Novosti Ukraine. Editor-in-chief Kirill Vyshensky accused of treason. She also meets with her Ukrainian counterpart Yudmila Denisova. On the same day, it is revealed that the Ukrainian servicemen have been added to the list of prisoners up for an exchange. The military prosecutor's office of Ukraine names 14 Russian servicemen as suspects in the seizure of the Ukrainian sailors. They are charged with planning, preparing, and initiating a military conflict by prior conspiracy. The court has sanctioned their arrest. Ukraine's great case against Russia regarding the Kerch Strait conflict is currently under consideration at the arbitration tribunal. The focus is on Russia's violation of the Ukrainian ship's immunity in open waters.